I saw the first finished frame, one frame of the film when the movie was half done. And up until that point, I had never seen what Tron was going to look like, but I was shooting it, making it, and just pretending I did know what it was going to look like. It was a leap of faith. So, you know, it was an era when, you know, I'll use the word founding, but we were founding a technology. And um, I don't know, I was, I was really confident because we, uh, I felt the story was solid because I spent so many years working on it and interviewing the people that were behind this. And um, I just, there was something about being the first one there. It, in, it, in, it inspired me tremendously. And then when I had the, the right team around me, I thought, what could be better than this? You have this new technology, you have enough money, and it's, it's going to be this great group of artists and, and film technicians that are you know, so talented, and we're gonna get there first. You know? And th that was just really exhilarating. And it's a different time today. You know? it's, people talk ab about originality, um, this is a more reactive time when people are trying to, you know, make things more, how do I put it, more practical for wider applications to make things real, you know. You, you, you build a Wright Brothers plane and then later on you build a, a jetliner that carries people around the world. That's the time we're in now, you know, where we're, we're making things for everyone compared to making these leaps of faith that we made back then. And I think that's okay, you know, I think that's part of the cycle. Um, but it, it was really exciting to be first. Um, in terms of the, the story, it was, uh, it was inspired partially by Spartacus. I like that movie, I'm a 60s person. And the idea of a revolution, um, was in the air. You know, we felt that the technology, computers, was in, were only in the hands of IBM. And one day, if we, we, we naively believed that the world would be perfect if we could just get those tools and get them in our hands. You know, if, if we all had a computer, nothing could stop us. And um, that, was, that was in the air. That was something that motivated us, the belief in that. And of course, you know, that turned out to be true, because the world's perfect now, thanks to that. <laughs> so, Richard and Harrison, talk a little bit about the challenges of shooting all this, because it's almost as if there were two films. There was this live action film that had to be shot, you know, conventionally, even though it was unconventional, but with a film and a camera, and then there was the animated uh, process afterwards. The, the, the challenge was to try to pay attention to the details, but keep the overall picture. The, excuse the pun, but when a director, and who also happens to be the writer, gives, makes this commitment, it's up to you to fulfill the vision. The, the, the very fortunate part for, for Richard and I was that we had uh, seen this vision articulated very, very well. There were, there were three very key uh, designers, uh, Sid Mead, Mobius, and, and Peter Lloyd, thank you. Uh, and, and they, they distilled the vision into this amazing design. And to be able to be part of that and to find that challenge, yet at the same time worry about what exposure should be on what cell, on what, of the, yeah, 76,000 frames is just a huge number to manage, just to keep them in order, to have people who can figure out how to number each one, and you can't you, you can't overstate how much how important the details were. But at the same time, you got to make the whole film look like it's one person, and so you have 400 people working on the visual effects on this film and on production, and 
all 400 have to be on, literally on the same page. You can't say, oh, look, I can tell that shot is, is, is put together by the person who did the three shots before it. No, it has to, it has to have a consistency to it and also reflect what the story is. Uh, let me address some of the computer simulation stuff because at the time we made Tron, there, was no, there were no PCs, there were no Macs, there was no internet. Uh, every Actually, oh, hang, hang on a second. How many people here were born after 1982? No cell phones. <laughs> right, so there were no cell phones. Um, the computer simulation companies that worked on the film, Magi Synth Division from Elms from New York, and Triple I were the two main companies, and then Robert Abel and Associates did the real world, the electronic world transition. But each one of those companies had their own software and their own hardware. Each computer simulation company was like a hot rod. They had their own engine, they had their own, uh, you know, own way of, of driving the thing. And so it was our job to make the imagery from one match the other. So we did stylizations of, uh, of the objects to, uh, to make them look similar. But one of the most difficult things was that the people who were the technicians in these places were not artists per se. They were technical people who were writing in Fortran, and uh, you know there wasn't even C at that time. And remember, there's no Maya, no Max, no Lightwave, no you know uh, uh, Nuke, no After Effects, no Photoshop. They would take Polaroids of what's on the monitor and mail them to me. <laughs> I'd open the envelope, look at the Polaroid, and then I'd get them on the phone. Okay. 